way. And over the years, uh, with her garden and small farm, whatever she had, in fact, we had a presentation here, I think a year or two ago at our annual meeting, where uh, this exhibit has been uh, uh, moved in our, in our uh, museum to a more prominent place, and we've got a, a nice narrative as to you know, what it all entails. Uh, uh, that's the uh, kind of the area of the mounds here. Uh, Moundsville, uh, and we call it the New Brighton Area Historic Society because we, we encompass a lot of the uh, area north and uh, around New Brighton. But uh, that shows you the mounds. And looking at the uh, people always ask, why, why, why call it Moundsville? Well, there, there were a lot of uh, uh, mound deposits, primarily from the retreating glaciers. They left all these lakes. Now, if you ever been up to the uh, the old Arsenal property, uh, just the south of Kanarurai, uh, there's a huge uh, uh, gravel deposit that uh, when a glacier glaciers melt, they left a pile of gravel. In fact, for many many years, uh, a company called Arsenal Sand and Gravel hauled tons and tons of gravel out of there. Uh, uh, they're no longer doing that now, so that's Mount's view. The first settlers, Wayne. Uh, is that the Perrys? Charles and Aurelia Perry. Yeah, they they uh, they uh, immigrated from. Uh, Actually, they were born in France through Switzerland and immigrated to this country from Canada. They, uh, they went to Canada from Europe, and the uh, parents traveled down the Red River in an ox cart to get to Fort Snelling. And uh, uh, Charles Perry was 10 years old at the time. And, uh, and soon thereafter, when he, when he matured, he eventually settled in the uh, Lake Johanna area. So, and that was. Uh, I think it was uh, that was uh, 1849. Yeah, that's when it was. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Much better. That's the that's the ox cart. They uh, they traveled out. Imagine on the Red River Valley from Canada. And they settled in the Lake Johanna area. That's their first house. Um, officially, they're not New Brighton residents, and they were in the Lake Johanna area, but they farmed there, and they actually opened up the, uh, the beach on the northwest side of Lake Johanna, which we used to go to as youth. So it was, uh, it was a bold move by them to, to head out. In fact, uh, Joyce Collins, you're an expert on the Perry family, I believe. We don't need your dissertation now, but... Uh, Are you sure? <laughs> no, but, no. But uh, Joyce, uh, was, Joyce Collins was married to a Perry, and, uh, and so she knows a lot about the family. You can talk to her later. That's St. Anthony Falls, uh, which is about seven miles away from Lake Shahan, and uh, the Perrys relate then that they could hear the, the water rumbling on a quiet summer night. Just before the falls were dammed up and tamed a little bit, so. <coughs> New Brighton, Bisinger, Jacob and Caroline Bisinger, they were the first residents uh, in New Brighton in about 1886, and they settled uh, on the uh, southwest side of Long Lake, uh, and went into farming there. Uh, I know we we lived uh, very near there growing up in New Brighton, so Bisinger family was quite prominent and uh, hardworking, and uh, they they were the first official New Brighton residents, even before New Brighton was a town. Oh, <laughs> yeah, this is interesting. Huh? Other mounds we. Township, there must be kind of a rogues gallery of the pictures. Sam Eaton, Fuller Thompson, William Fargo, Socrates Thompson, Kip Carter, and your great uh, uncle, Blackjack, later Fargo, Wayne. And you, you probably know him pretty well. Yeah. Anyway, trivia. Farming. 
this was before before the railroads, and what the area. I mean, yeah, it was was flat, was 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 flat. It, and, uh, it wasn't real good farmland, but it was good for certain vegetables and potatoes and uh, corn and stuff like that. And so uh, most of the early settlers uh, were farmers. That's a uh, where are we there, Wayne? Yeah, that's a. Uh, uh, John Moga had a farm up Highway 10 under the, the uh, what's that? That's Moga there, yeah. I remember, I recognize him. Uh, and uh, and uh, Jacob Lear had a farm south of, uh, just south of Long Lake. And of course, Bisinger had a farm on the south, southwest side of Long Lake. And that was the main, the main industry. There were a lot of other farmers that were coming in. This was before the railroad. Uh, and I think you've got a a shot here of uh, that's uh, Jacob, uh, yeah, right there. So you got a shot of the uh, some of the names. You can see the uh, Perry, the Ryan, the Powers, Thompson, Marston, Waldeck, Boner, Shooters, Skyler, Brodowski, Ryback, Bush, Wyshevsky. Some, a lot of the families are still around today. The railroad. That was the catalyst that. That, I mean, that defined the territory during the the, uh, the next uh, several decades. It uh, it uh, it was an amazing uh, uh, development for the area and brought a tremendous amount of industry. What yeah one one uh, uh, one reason uh, for the new brightness is that uh, a lot of the cattle came from North Dakota, Montana. And federal law said you have to stop and water and feed them every every 36 hours. I think it was so. The logical point between Chicago and uh, uh, the western states was uh, was New Brighton, and so uh, the, uh, the movers and shakers got together and uh, decided to build the stockyards there. One one uh, one one problem with uh, is that. Uh, uh, all the railroads were semi-transcontinental, and, and I know uh, in the late 80s they formed the Minnesota Transfer Railway, and that would enable the rail cars that came in through the Twin Cities to be broken up and transferred to different different areas of, of the uh, of the, uh, of the state. So uh, that that helped a great a great deal. And there's the uh, federal law. Twin Cities are right in the nucleus. St. Paul was the uh, was the uh, first uh, first place to uh, to uh, develop stockyards and packing company. Where I remember so St. Paul as a kid, we could drive drive down there, but you could smell it. It was pretty bad, but that was a St. Paul deal. And back then, the Minneapolis St. Paul had a lot of competition, and uh, a group headed up by John Pillsbury and, and several other movers and shakers said. We got to have a Minneapolis stockyards and packing company. There, well, there it is, and uh, and so that's what they that's what they did. They got together and uh, with the Minnesota Transfer Railway uh, and uh, developed a, a rail line up up north in Brighton and uh, developed the stockyards and packing company. There, there is those are uh, one of the advertisements. It was Minneapolis stockyards, now it's called Twin City stockyards, and eventually it's going to be the New Brighton area, but uh, uh, New Brighton wasn't a town yet. Uh, it actually says New Brighton, Minnesota, so uh, this is some of their advertising. And if you look at the uh, the killing capacity, 141,000 cattle, 81,000 hogs, it was huge. Uh, and uh, and uh, it was a big deal, and it started in about 1989 to 1990. Eighteen. Eighteen. Excuse me. All right, Wayne. There's a picture. Now, this is an amazing rendering. It's not to scale, but it really shows you the the uh, the massivity of the uh, of the of the cattle industry. The stockyards on the left. You see the packing houses, uh, ice, two ice, ice houses down on the, on the lake, uh, and 
and the water tower, you see the uh, uh, Exchange Hotel up there, number one, thanks Wayne. Uh, that was uh, reported to be the largest hotel uh, this side of Chicago. It was, it was amazing. And uh, it, uh, the whole, I mean, I can, I can play with it for its, for its time. The hotel was extremely modern. It actually had, uh, had, uh, it had hotel rooms, it had a gambling casino, it had offices for the uh, stockyard and the rendering plant companies, um, it uh, had a generator that provided electricity. And this was in the 1890s, and nobody, nobody had it. It was a, a very advanced facility, and it could accommodate several hundred guests, and uh, it, was, uh, it was the talk of the town. Uh, Okay, Wayne. That gives you a bigger perspective of, uh, of, the, of the stock there. It's fairly on the left of the packing houses. In the city of New Brighton, uh, you see uh, it's 10th Street, what they called Front Street back in those days. And the intersection there is supposedly Fifth, the Fifth Avenue that they call, uh, it's, old, it's Highway 8. They called that Main Street back then. And you can see the, uh, the relative uh, of how everything kind of, uh, kind of fits together. Uh, and of course, the railroad was the major, major catalyst that brought everything together. All, all those, a lot of those buildings you see on the right there are, are hotels. At one point in time, the town had six or seven hotels, six or seven saloons. It, uh, I mean, use your imagination. This was a boom town. And uh, people were coming in un unbelievably fast to find place to put them up, the hotels and the building houses. And uh, before the uh, automobile or truck, uh, it was quite a time. The demise of the packing houses. I could talk about the demise of the packing houses. Packing houses, if you can imagine, uh, were, were built in roughly 19 1891, and by the by the year 2000, they were, by the year 1900, they, they were all uh, out of business. There were two of them there. And the reason they gave is that the railroads uh, uh, were favoring Chicago. They were giving the, the cattle, the cattle, the cattle of route from the uh, Montana, North Dakota. They were making it cheaper to go to Chicago than to go to New Brighton. And that gradually put a squeeze on them and they, they couldn't compete. Another reason given is that uh, um, they had environmental problems. There was uh, they have waste disposal problems, and uh, with that killing capacity and that slaughter rate, I would imagine that they would. I don't know why they put all the, uh, the uh, all the waste. So that, at least that was the spin they gave it. Uh, modern times we just couldn't uh, deal with our, our waste disposal, so uh, so uh, we we closed them down. City of Brooklyn. Makes me cold. Uh, it was formed in uh, 1891, and uh, uh, before that, it was uh, just, just just an area. But they actually formed a uh, 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 a marshal's office, uh, uh, fire marshal, and rules and regulations to govern to govern the city. Uh, the the name New Brighton was was given by a guy named W. H. Estes. Is that his name? Eustis or Estes? And um, and he he came from a town called Brighton, Massachusetts, where there were Brighton uh, stockyards and slaughterhouses out there. So he named the town New Brighton, and uh, so far it's stuck. Okay, early businesses, churches. Do you have any pictures, Wayne? Uh, when we we grew up in New Brighton. Uh, all these buildings you can see were there. Uh, this would be in the in the uh, mid to late forties and early even into the early fifties. Uh, this was a transit house. Uh, 
which was a saloon and a hotel uh, on the corner of, right, right across the street now, on the uh, southwest corner of, uh, of Front Street and Main Street. Main, Main Street being Old Highway, Front Street being 10th, 10th Street. And so just getting going across the street where it was. It eventually became apartment houses on top and Eddie's, Eddie's, Eddie's Bar and Saloon or Bob. Remember those days, Mike? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is this the Hanova building. That was right across the street from uh, from uh, the uh, the transit house, and uh, it would be on the uh, northwest corner of Old Highway Gate and Tenth Street. Uh, and that again was a saloon, a hotel, and it was built on, on this lowland. It was built up. On the, on the bottom where there was actually livestock uh, quarters in the bottom part of the building. Oh, that's the, uh, that's on, on 10th Street or Front Street as they call it. That's about uh, one block west of uh, the transit house. And uh, that is the old Divine Hotel, I believe. And uh, that back in the 18, 1890s. And uh, we lived two blocks I grew up two blocks uh, west, west of there on, on 10th Street. And that building was still there. It was uh, into an apartment house and some kind of a business type thing. But uh, uh, the building still stood into the, into the 50s and maybe the early 60s, whenever they redeveloped downtown the Brighton. But uh, uh, again, that's another hotel and saloon. Then we talked about the, uh, the uh, Exchange Hotel. Uh, Interesting, uh, when the uh, stockyards and pack, the packing plant business, businesses that left the area, the hotel basically, you know, gradually went out of business. And uh, in, in fact, uh, I think in 1934, Weisinger, Weisinger's Hardware became, bought the building for, I think, $1,000. Took it off the top two stories because the roof was leaking and all that, and uh, made Weisinger's Hardware all through the 40s and 50s, it was the only place to go to. And their motto was, uh, if we don't have it, you don't need it. And so that was the only place to go, and, and you went to Weisinger's. The Marston Block, Wayne? That is uh, directly across the street from the uh, community center. That would be on the uh, the, uh, the southeast corner of Old Highway 8 and 10th, 10th Street. Uh, that was, uh, it had, it had uh, blacks, a blacksmith uh, uh, facilities, and a liquor store, and a bank, and a, a general store. Originally it was, uh, I think, uh, uh, Small Sports had it over there. They moved across the street to Small Sports and Zomers. And this became Bicycle and Johnson's. That's it right there. And that's a, I think that's when the small store had it. That's the old blacksmith. That became Perrin Motors, I believe. And that's a barber shop. Oh, yeah. This is a, this is the lumber company. Uh, Wayne, uh, originally it was, it was a Barrow's lumber company originally. Very, very, yeah. Wayne's great grandpa, Franklin Searles, who was one of the town's original movers and shakers in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, bought this. And your grandfather, Dewey, his, his son eventually, uh, eventually took it over. And uh, uh, that's looking down 10th Street, which is Front Street. And you see the uh, you see the Hedova building and the transit house. And you, you point down there the old divine divine house, straight down the uh, and that's still standing. That's just across the railroad tracks. That's one of the ice houses, right, Wayne? Uh, I believe there were two ice houses on the uh, east side of the lake. And again, the, uh, the 
packing plant and stockyard facilities was the integrated operation. It had, you know, its own channel pans, it had its own slot up studs, and had ice uh, to uh, pack the carcasses in when they shipped them out. And uh, it was a, you see the blocks of ice, it was a very important facility. That and the Long Lake at that time, I don't know if it still is, we had very, very pure water. And, uh, and the north end of the lake was um, muddier and, and uh, uh, dirtier water. But this, this made some beautiful ice, and they sold it all over the country. Put it on, on train cars and just sold ice, and they also used it to pack the cattle. but uh, uh, there are houses there now. But uh, that was one of the many. They, they needed so much, so many hotel facilities for all the people coming in. And the Gunderson Hotel was located just up the street on 8th Avenue, wasn't it? And we think, 8th, 8th Avenue, we think that's where your house was. And there was no sign of it when our houses were built in the 30s and 40s. But at the turn of the century, uh, uh, it was, uh, it, there were hotels everywhere. And saloons, I might add. The Fraser Company Library, uh, I don't know where that exactly was, but they had one there. Boston Ice Company showed up on the uh, southwest corner of the lake, just below Bicinger's uh, uh, um, facility up on, up on the lake. And that was an operation uh, up into the 50s anyway. I remember, I could practically see it from our house, and we walked by it every day going down along the lake. So uh, uh, then the Brighton Elevator Company was, was uh, I handled a lot of grain from the local farmers. Here's a, a beloved depot. Sioux Line, Sioux Line had this, and I believe it's depot business based out sometime in the 50s. You were babysat there, Joyce. When, when was the 50s or early 60s? Yes. Hmm? Yeah, that's when I babysat, but it was. <laughs> Was it last, still a functioning depot? The last year was 59. 59? That's when Mr. Bjork left. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Now, you, you bought, I think you took advantage of it. You bought this from Sue Land for how much? The answer the dollar. They paid a dollar for it. And, you, of course, it cost a fortune to move it. When, what, what day did you approximately buy it and move it? I think what? You approximately uh, bought it and moved it. We moved it in 1990. 1990, okay. And it uh, it took several years. Anyway, I think most of you have been up to the uh, to the current depot, and it's a it's a beautiful facility. Uh, the the board at that time, and I wasn't I wasn't in town. I wasn't on the board. They did a, one, a masterful job of uh, taking it apart board by board and putting it back together. And uh, it's a uh, it functions of the great museum, and uh, we we love it. Railroad. That's the uh, Irondale uh, steel mill, isn't it, Wayne? And the railroads bought more industry into the area, and that's just one case. That started around the turn of the century, the late 1800s, I think. And uh, it burned down in, I think, 1891, and it uh, burned down a few years later, and they never decided to, uh, to, uh, to rebuild it. Uh, but uh, that's really where the name Irondale uh, was established by the uh, that facility. Was that the uh, brickyard? The, yeah, the brick. Just up the street from there was the uh, brick brickworks, and that uh, that came into being in about the 1920s or 30s, and that uh, is no longer there. But it was a major supplier of jobs for for the whole area. Oh, these are the. Yeah, this is just uh, just just south of the Bullyards. Uh, there's a lake down there called the Jones Lake, 
the phosphate. What's the lake down there, Ron? Jones. Jones. Uh, and they had a huge sheep raising facility, which is interesting because a lot of the, uh, this was back in the 20s and 30s, I think, a lot of the farmers back then were pig farmers. Uh, you know, I mean, there were probably six or eight major pig farmers in the area. So, uh, but uh, this was uh, this was the big sheep area. And the pole yards came in. Uh, in fact, we celebrated Bell Lumber and Poles 100th anniversary uh, just a couple of years ago. So, uh, uh, there were two pole, pole yards, uh, McGillis and Gibbs and Bell Lumber and Pole. Bell Lumber and Pole is still there. And uh, they're doing after a they had a major uh, contamination cleanup with all the creosote that got into the ground. But they did that. They paid uh, over a million dollars to get it done. And then uh, they have diversified, and uh, they're doing quite well. I understand. In fact, we had them uh, a couple years ago. They celebrated their hundredth anniversary. So um, it was uh, it was uh, it's quite a, quite a business. Churches. Wayne. Your grandfather in the 1890s, along with Eustace and uh, a few other guys, got together to form a uh, uh, Protestant church. Uh, there was no churches in the immediate area. There was a Catholic church over in Art Hill somewhere. But uh, most of the early settlers were Protestant. And, uh, and uh, so they, they, they put the resources together to build this church. And uh, it became my church. I got confirmed there back in the uh, late 40s. I guess I did. That? Is that St. John's? Demographics. I like demographics. The early settlers were largely Protestant. And as all this industry spoke, uh, rose up, you know, from the pole yards, and the steel mills, and the stock yards, the slaughterhouses, the rain rate mines, uh, and the farms, um, a lot of workers came in. A lot of those workers were Polish, and a lot of them were Catholic. And so, uh, 10 years later, I think it was in 19, 19, 1902, they uh, started a St. John's Parish. And for the first, I think it was 20 years, they worshipped out of a basement. And then they eventually built this very, and I thought it was a, a beautifully, uh, very, uh, very European style cathedral type, type building. It was, wasn't real big, but uh, it wasn't big enough for St. John's because uh, uh, at the, at the at, I think our church, when I went to it, there was like 200 members in our Protestant church. St. John's has got 7,000 members now. It's, it's unbelievable. And of course, they raised that building and moved, moved up the street. And, and, uh, but it was sad to, sad to see that old structure go. Uh, is that the first schoolhouse? Hmm? School. Yeah, that uh, that was in. Uh, uh, I think they phased that out in 1938 when they. Yeah, that was the first. It was a, a one grade school, and. Yeah, it was built in 1890, and uh, and, uh, and and by 1939 they had, they had graduated 234 students from the eighth grade. So uh, that was an old. Uh, in fact, that building uh, eventually became Sutcher Carlson. If you remember Sutcher Carlson in the old days? It was a, one of the first early TV manufacturers. And in fact, we've got one in our in our depot. Uh, uh, it was. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, it was a, they were way ahead of their time. They used that old school for the first first factory. They didn't last very long, but uh, they did. So this is uh, uh, the uh, New Brighton Great School. Uh, that was uh, established in 1939. Uh, federal government funds, trying to, you know, outdo the, you know, just the, 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 the depression era funds. Uh, built that school. And that's where I went. That's where Wayne went. That's where Ron Cota went. That's where Joyce went. And uh, I don't know who else went there. But uh, that was phased out in, uh, 
You talked you talk there, Joyce, didn't you? I did. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was phased out. It was, eventually it was torn down about 10 years ago to, for, for some kind of housing project. That was the old New Brighton Town Hall. It was kind of a, a big white edifice that just kind of it was a big box. And, uh, but it had the uh, police department at the bottom and uh, city offices, and they had a big dance hall uh, up on top where they hosted a lot of weddings and a lot of things like that. That stood as kind of a, it was, it was on the, just north of where the uh, current, uh, just across uh, Veterans Park from the current uh, uh, Civic Center. So, uh, uh, and that bunch got torn down. Most of the right got torn down. Roads. Right? This is uh, before the auto, but the auto was just coming in. The main way from New Brighton to Minneapolis was Highway 8. I mean, that's how you got there. And it was a uh, dirt mud road, and uh, gradually, of course, it it got uh, improved, but uh, uh, it was uh, it was uh, it was difficult. And that's a picture of uh, William Perry uh, digging out of the mud. I wait since the bullet. That's way down in, uh, in near St. Anthony. So uh, it was a, a continuous project to build the roads. Now, as a car was coming, a car was coming into being. There's there's a crew, uh, 10th, 10th Street, or they call it Front Street, ended just uh, up around where St. John's is. And uh, this is the crew bringing it up the hill toward where Moundsview is today. Uh, it just shows you the uh, conditions that they went through to, uh, to uh, get roads in the area. Oh, what's that, Wayne? Electricity. 1914. Electricity was brought uh, brought to the area. Electric company was formed and uh, put in poles and wires, and uh, we got electricity. Volunteer fire department established in uh, 1914. We've got that that pull cart in our depot on display. That's uh, one of their first pieces of equipment. And of course, today the fire department is uh, is uh, a lot different, a lot more responsive. But it was pretty primitive back then. And uh, what 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 did they say here? The company started with two extension ladders, a hose cart, which you see there, carried 600 feet of hose, was manned by village residents and businessmen who answered the call of a ringing alarm from the town hall. Pioneer Homes. That's the Farrell home. Uh, that's just east of here. And that's still standing, I believe. Uh, it's on your house tour, right, Joyce? Uh, uh, there it is. In fact, that, uh, that's, that's some of their farmland. In fact, uh, they had over 500 acres. Uh, a good part of the property on the South end, south end, and southeast end, southwest end, went to for St. John's Church and uh, parochial school. Up, up the hill, a big chunk of it went to build Mountfield High School. So a lot of their land was that, that, that way. That's the Foss home on Silver Lake Road. That, that is still there. I know uh, Andy, you live, you live very near there. Uh, it's, it's actually on the National Historic Registry, that house. It's a, it's a beauty. That's a Reasoner house. I think you live next door to there, Wayne. That house is still standing. Neighbors are bad. What? The neighbors are bad. Are they your bad neighbors? Yeah, next door. Are they here? <laughs> Gotta be careful, be careful. Uh, this is the hip residence at uh, Long Lake. Uh, I have spent a lot of time there. I worked for Joe Hip 
uh, probably on and off for eight or ten years. And uh, from the early 50s to the late 50s, uh, I would trek up the railroad tracks, and I started at 35 cents an hour, and I worked up to a tractor driver, a dollar an hour, a truck driver, maybe it was a dollar and a quarter I was making an hour. But this is where he lived. Uh, Joe Hip was a bachelor. And he owned that whole farm where our park is today and our depot is. And he lived with his uh, brother's wife, Louise, who also became a founding member of the Historic Society, in this, in this old brick house. Okay, this was in the 50s. They had no indoor plumbing. No indoor plumbing. They had uh, uh, no electricity. They had, yes? Louise's husband, Eddie. Yeah. He was there. <laughs> but Eddie, Eddie was a traveling salesman. <laughs> so who knows what Eddie? But, uh, but he was gone quite a bit. He had a truck and he sold produce around the, around the area. But Louise was there raising four kids, uh, uh, and they were, they were nice kids. Uh, and but the fact that they grew up, they had an outhouse. You know, no indoor plumbing means you don't have an out, you don't have a trailer. And uh, they had an outhouse, just what we're waiting to sit it would be from that picture. And <laughs> just, just up the hill from where the pump was to pump the water out of it. Oh, it's a trickle down theory, huh? But uh, anyway, and we had, we'd work late summer nights in the, in the fall, harvesting, you know. And he'd come down, Joe would, with, with a lantern. Gas one of the kind of the wick. That's, that, that's, how they, that's how they lived. And I remember one day in particular, I remember it was winter day, we were doing something, I think we were spreading manure, or cleaning, we, to, we also cleaned the stock yards with, with tractors and trucks. But uh, uh, he, he was heating up water on the stove, and he soaked his hands in it, he had arthritis in his hands. He was just, you know, I mean, it was, it was just primitive. And he, he sold the farm for over $500,000, and you know, he could have, but he was just that, you know, he had pretty new cars, good equipment, and, uh, but he just, uh, you know, he just lived that way. In fact, uh, he, he, we, we, he grew a lot of stuff, uh, uh, and a lot of squash, a lot of strawberries, a lot of, a lot of rhubarb. And he didn't have a phone, as I said. So Jerry, Jerry Freeman, who was also in the fire department, uh, he was chief after my dad was, I think. Uh, we, yeah. The, the, the Red Owl and National Key, all the stores would call his wife at his home. Jerry would come home from work at 3 o'clock from the railroad and take the orders by his car. He'd give them to Joe. And this would be like 3 30, 4 o'clock. And we thought we were in there done. Well, you got Red Owl wants 35 packages, and your National Stores wants 25 packages, a case of a room. And so we'd have to. I ate more rhubarb. Uh, I know your rhubarb uh, jam is very good, Mary, but I ate so much rhubarb, we would get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were going to go home at 5 o'clock, so anyway, we worked at 8 o'clock, and mosquitoes and all that. So. But that was, uh, that's TMI, too much information? Okay, where are we waiting? Oh, the design house. That was across, almost across the street from where I, where I grew up. I was a block, a block down across the street. In fact, you lived next door, Joyce, for a while, didn't you? To the White House? So that's still there. That's the Espinette house, huh? That's still there too, isn't it, Wayne? Yeah. He was also one of the... Uh... Yes. That was my house. I lived there. What's that? I lived in that house too. The Espinette house? Yes. Did you really? Yes. That's where you moved? When you moved uh... Yeah. Because she was lived across the street from us. Yes. And all of a sudden one day she moved. <laughs> and I had no idea where she moved. Yeah. 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 Well, that's good to know you tell me. That's good to know. But uh, one thing on Espinette, he was also a Hoover chair. He was one of the founders of the church with your great-grandfather, right? Congregate Espinette. Yeah, he was a Hoover chair. This was the house of Franklin and Sadie Searles. Is that house still there, too? Huh? But that's not there. They, they had fire. No. Fires happen. So, too bad. Swanson Dairy Farm, yeah, that's a, 
That's up in the brain. That house is still standing, right? I've been taking your tour yet, Joyce. You can tell, can't you? <laughs> Joyce has put together a great driving tour of all the old historic houses. In, in fact, last I think last April you did a, a program here on all the old houses. So uh, this is kind of redundant. And there's the old Fletcher House on Old Highway 8. Yeah, John has now passed away. Okay, Wayne. Where are we now? Where's that? Fletcher, okay. Right. This is kind of, I shouldn't use the word boring. Um, in fact, so there wasn't a lot to do. And then you show James J. Hill's state, North Oaks, as, as if any of the new Brighton people went out to North Oaks to play around. I don't know, but I think the people out there did. And because uh, he had a great, uh, great estate there, and he owned them. They say the largest buffalo herd of, in, in the world was uh, in North Oaks right there. But uh, uh, yeah, they could afford to play, okay? The work with girls in Brighton did this kind of stuff. They built a platform to, to, to do dances, okay? And they had a baseball team. Again, this was before 1940. So uh, after 1940, the uh, city of New Brighton, they had a great softball team. I mean, they were one of the best in the area. Uh, but this is back. This is back then. The girls, the girls got to have fun too. And uh, and uh, there's the, the boys' baseball team. This is back in the 20s and 30s, guys. Oh, Daniel Squash Show. That used to be a big deal. It's not in 1929. Uh, I know Joe Hitt grew a lot of squash uh, because he sold it commercially. Uh, and he didn't grow it. He didn't grow like these giant pumpkin guys, 2,000 2, pound pumpkins. Uh, he just grew squash commercially. But uh, the squash show was a big deal every, uh, every October. And it went on for quite a while. I think they moved it up from, this was originally in uh, the New Brighton grade school auditorium. And they moved it up to Irondale, I believe, in later years. Uh, but that was, a, that was a big fall thing. Okay, they also, <laughs> there were a few horse races around town. Perry Swimming Beach was a, was a, was a place that was very popular for Minneapolis people. Uh, we used to go over there in New Brighton. The girls were much nicer over there. And uh, they, the, the, uh, they had bands and orchestras, choral groups, and the drama clubs and comedy clubs, picnics, skating, and fishing contests back then. Okay. Okay, we're just about done here. Yeah, World War I was a, was a, was a tough time. Uh, that was in 1917, 18. Uh, and we lost uh, some boys there, and there is a uh, memorial, I think it's a Veterans Park down here, that, uh, that uh, lists a lot of the uh, men who lost their lives. Uh, last but not least, and what have we got there? Yeah, that's a memorial. Last but not least. <laughs> okay. I don't know why they did this, but apparently people people back then were different. This was 1933 State Fair. They were still the Great Depression, and uh, and, and uh, President Roosevelt had this National Recovery Act going, uh, and they had, and Sula had two excess locomotives that were they still worked, but they were obsolete. They burned too much coal or something, so they were uh, put on service. They took two locomotives. One was deemed the Old Man Depression. The other was deemed the uh, WPA, or the Recovery Act, and Public Work Act, I think it was. And they cheated. The, the, uh, the Depression was dealt with gasoline. Long story short, they, they moved the, the trains to the state fair. They put them on opposing tracks. They did a collision. And uh, the engineers jumped out just a couple hundred feet before the uh, collision, and they doused the depression uh, engine with gasoline. And when they hit, old man depression blew up. And, uh, and so that's what they did to stay fair back then. Uh, anyway, uh, that's all I have. Do we have any, any questions? It was a, it was a part of time.
took Fred and I uh, several hours or several meetings to put this together. And we should we should have had that film. Use the microphone. Use the microphone. We should have had that had that film because uh, we started telling stories. And of course we wouldn't be able to show a lot of that here. <laughs> but it was it was fun. We had more fun doing this. <laughs> we we grew up through this, you know, it's it's it was almost like living in the fifties, which we did too, and we were happy for that. But uh, yeah, it, it was fun. It was it was a it was a good time. Uh, it's like Brighton, uh, the mayor, uh, mayor Curry's here somewhere. Thanks for coming. Uh, was now it's a bedroom community. Uh, back then it was stupid, but they were all hotels. Now you've got what one hotel in town, and that's people just passing through. I mean, it was a really different time, and that was of course. Before, was it, before Prohibition came in in 1919, that lasted until 1933. And so that really put a damper on a lot of stuff. You know, all the saloons closed down, they had to, you know, except the speakeasy. He said, your grandpa went to him. We won't talk about that. But uh, the area has just changed, and uh, probably for the better, run. I got a question about Joe Gibbs' farm. Was that the, was he the first Farmer on that property, and was that the only house that was on it? No, his his uh, grand his grandfather bought it, and his dad farmed farmed, and then Joe uh, had several brothers. Uh, Pete Hill was the postmaster, and lived in New Brighton. New Brighton postmaster for a long time. Eddie Hill, I talked about, had a produce truck that uh, he delivered around around the area, and he was uh, gone for a week at a time or three days at a time, whatever it was. And I think there was one other. There was a sister who was not involved at all. And it was one of the brother, I think. But uh, when Joe sold the farm in uh, in, uh, in the seventies, I think, for five hundred thousand dollars, he went right up to when we we picked her up and out, right up to Elk River and bought that farm in the river, which is probably worth <laughs> it's a beauty. So Joe grew up in that house. Joe, Joe, yes, yes, and he had one room up in the up in the uh, southeast corner. And uh, the one thing about Joe. You work, you kept your own, kept your own hours on a, on a timesheet that was posted in one of the buildings, and there was never any payday. The, the payday was whenever you could catch us. Enough guys could say, Joe, we got to get paid. It could be three weeks, it could be four weeks, ten days. And then he'd get down and get the gasoline, and we'd sit down in the basement, the bathroom, the gasoline lantern, and he'd get a cigar box, full money, and you know, get 35, 50 cents an hour, and he worked. 20, 30 hours a week, I mean, it took 10, 15 dollars. I mean, that was a big pay. <laughs> All in cash, no taxes, no nothing. And that's, that's what it was. He was really, and he was a, a very likable guy, a generous guy. And he had a very quiet demeanor. Never rarely raised his temperature, tem temper, but uh, he looked at you that certain way, you know you were in trouble. So. Uh, but it was, uh, it was quite a time, and it was great to uh, grow up there. Yes? Yes. Where did you go to high school? Because I know, I know you know started in 1970. Yes. And uh, Joyce was an expert in that too. I went to grade school with Joyce. In uh, what's that? 54. 54 was the first one. We graduated in 59. Joyce and I. Six was the first What's that? Mullinsville. Yeah. And and Ron could tell the story. Ron Cotter. Um, be before that time. Bouncy wouldn't have been built. We would have went to Edison or Marshall or White Bear Lake or who knows where. Well, well, it's there, was, there were several. White Bear Lake, North St. Paul, University of Minnesota, Marshall, Edison, and there was one other. I can't think of And you, you never went to Bouncy, did you? Washington, St. Paul, Washington, St. Paul, Murray. Okay. I think there were nine high schools that kids went to. But the light is busy. Yeah, and so, you know, they said, we can no longer take your kids. And that's when they hired Ralph Breeder from the University of Minnesota, and he started the consolidation process of all of the little elementary school districts in the area. And the first vote came up that only one community did not want it to happen, and it was Lake Johanna. It was Lake Johanna School. I've just done research on this, so I know what's going on. <laughs> anyway, um, he came back a year later and said, guess what? Where are your kids going to go to school? There is no high school that will take them anymore. 
they finally agreed, that was 1953, 1954 Moundsview opened. Yeah. Yeah. Ralph Reeder, that's why we had a Ralph Reeder Elementary, was named after that genius of a man who was able to get these eight school districts together, but he had no choice, and he was, a, he was just a wonderful administrator. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great school. You went to Irondale? Yes. You did? Okay, yeah. There was no Irondale until 1967. 1967. So, yeah, we, we missed out. We didn't have that. Huh? I think, Joyce, would we have went to Irondale hypothetically or went to Monsu? Yeah. We well, it just depended on where we would fit. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't fit in anywhere. Back then, the margins, or the yeah, boundaries changed, changed, and it was all yeah. based on the creek that went through Hanson Park. It was called Judicial Ditch Number Two. <laughs> it was called, and whoever had the most space, those kids went to Moundsview. If they didn't, they went to Irondale. And my kids, three times there was a, a change in where they would go, and then they finally settled it. And that still, I think, is the boundary line. And Joyce, we had four boys. The first three went to Moundsview, then they changed, and our last one graduated from and they moved oh, the yeah. boundary 8th yeah. Avenue. 8th Avenue, they moved it. We probably would have went to Mount I mean, you were farther east. Fred would have gone to Mount Vue, we right on the other side of the street, we would have gone to Iron Right across the street. Well, and, and now I'm, I'm kind of on some Facebook pages with kids who are telling me they went to five different elementary schools before they finally got to Johanna Middle School. I taught, I taught there too after New Brighton closed. And, and I responded to them on Facebook. It never had to do what was best for kids. No. Moundsview never did it that way. They only was, where do you fit? So those kids bounced around to five different elementary schools during their, and yet they all turned out fine.